Live from the Hilton at Bonnet Creek, Orlando, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Vision 2015. Brought to you by IBM. And now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to Orlando, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. We're here at IBM Vision, this is the Cube. Check out ibmvisiongo.com. It's our interactive digital experience that we've created around this event. Michael Curry is here, he's the VP of Engineering for Analytics Solutions at IBM. Michael, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, thanks for having me. Another Boston boy, Bruins <laughs> fan, we love it. <laughs> From New York, but it's good to have you. So, um, well let's get into it. So, we were just talking to your colleagues about um, you know, the analytics business, performance management. You run the engineering side. That's correct. So, yeah. talk about your role, and then we'll get into it further. Yeah, so I run engineering for analytic solutions. It includes the uh, financial performance management, the sales performance management, our risk and GRC platforms, and then some of our industry solutions, uh, solution areas like predictive customer intelligence and predictive maintenance and quality. Um, some of the things like our Twitter data feeds and all kinds of stuff like that. So, really interesting set of technologies that I reside over. Well, you've got a lot of challenges. You've got a vast portfolio. Yep. Um, you've got new technologies, you've got older technologies, uh -huh. you've got a big customer base, you've got this new Twitter thing going on. Um, where are the priorities? Is it integration? Is it new function? I mean, it's yes, yes, and yes, and yes. So how do you <laughs> handle all that? Talk about the priorities first. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, this space in general, uh, analytics is an area that we have a nice position in. IBM is, uh, is kind of a leader in this, have been for a while. Um, we've acquired some great companies in the space. So yeah. uh, having the base that we have, the, uh, both the install base and the technology base is, is a fantastic position to be in. Um, but it's changing fa very quickly, right? There's a lot of um, pressure, there's a lot of new vendors arising, there's new technologies arising. Um, you saw the, the rise of the big data technology set over the last uh, five, six, seven years. And uh, as that's happened, it's put a lot of pressure on you know, kind of your core platforms and, and you have to be able to adjust to those changes. A lot of those changes are related to the cloud. Um, so we are really rapidly moving to cloud-centric technologies. And it's not so much just from the perspective of uh, it, customers want to be on the cloud necessarily. We, a lot of the customer base does, and we think that will increase over time. But a lot of it also has to do with cloud-centric technologies allow you to move at a faster pace. So it's really about agility. It's about how quickly can you innovate? How, how quickly can you introduce new capabilities into your product lines? How quickly can you allow your customers to adjust to new, new capabilities and new, um, you know, new paths that they could take with your technology? Uh, and how, can, how quickly can you incorporate new concepts into what you're doing? So the Twitter data is an example. Taking Twitter data or taking weather data is another um, thing that we, we deal with and starting to inject it to make our predictive models better or inject it into how we do things around um, optimization. Very interesting space to see how all those things need to converge together very quickly and, and cloud technology really does help you to do that. So that was a great setup. So Unfortunately, we only have 20 minutes, but, uh, <laughs> but let, me, let me start actually with the Twitter data. So we had Nate Silver on three years ago, and I asked Nate what he thought about the predictive capabilities of things like Twitter. Yeah. And he said, now this is granted, three years ago, he said the data's not there. Now Nate is used to polling and you know doing a statistical analysis, but he said the, twi the Twitter data is too raw, it, it, the, the, it doesn't, it, it's not there yet, the quality yeah. is not there yet. Has that changed? Oh yeah, it, it's amazing how, uh, you know, Twitter data, like anything else, has its quality issues. I mean, you're going to have things that will mislead you in, in Twitter data, just like anything else. But it's such a big sample set. It's such a huge amount of data that you can really learn things. I, I'll give you a, an interesting story that kind of combines together both the Twitter and the, um, the weather data. Uh, I, I was at the, the weather company, um, which is one of our partners, and we've uh, done a, a, a joint uh, agreement around and we were looking at weather data and we were looking at Twitter data. And it was interesting that they were actually able to see the weather patterns on Twitter before they saw it on their weather sensors. Because people would start really? to be tweeting about rain or you know, some kind of weather event. And then all of a sudden the weather, you know, they're, they're, they'd get their kind of delayed uh, reads from their weather stations and sure enough, there's rain there. 
So um, it's really interesting to see what a great predictor Twitter is. And you know, a lot of people think of Twitter data as simply a, uh, a sentiment analyzer, and it is a very good sentiment analyzer, but it's very good at other things as well. It's really become the fastest uh, way for people to convey information that we have in our society today. And it's shocking to think about all of the things you can do with that. Um, and, and how you can begin to combine that with other business data and really start to help to improve the way you make decisions, the, way, the things you can understand about your customer base, your products, the effectiveness of, of uh, different kinds of activities that you do in the market. So Michael, a lot of the, the data that you've historically dealt with is very structured, you know, systems of, of record, so to speak, and all of a sudden you have this huge influx of things like t Twitter data, <laughs> weather data, um, you know, so-called systems of engagement. Mm -hmm. How has that technology shift affected your engineering resources and Yeah, and I mean, look, it, it's been a big focus for us, right? It's clearly an area, uh, it, most of the world is unstructured data, and there's an incredible amount of, of value in that unstructured information. And so when we look at it, and unstructured is one of those terms that drive people, drives people crazy because it's really not, no such thing as unstructured information. Everything has some sort of structure to it, right? Uh, it, but, but the idea is... Non-rigid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the idea is you need to parse through it and, and understand what it is. And, and I think um, you know, a lot of our focus for Watson has really been on that cognitive under, understanding of what you know, human language, right? How, what is this actually saying? Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the agreement that we announced this morning with, um, with Deloitte around the um, you know, regulatory compliance and control uh, system, that's, that's really about you know, parsing through unstructured information that comes in through these new regulations and being able to understand what does that mean? What kind of controls do I need to put in place around that? Things like that are incredibly valuable in terms of speeding up the recognition of what things mean to businesses. And you know, since a vast majority of information that's created is created without thinking about putting it into some kind of a structured format, um, you need, you know, the faster you can react to that, the faster you can get the value out of it. I thought, I thought Tom, in, in the keynote from Deloitte, Tom Scampion had a really succinct uh, slide talking about the big changes in data, and obviously data powers the analytics. So you already talked about structured versus unstructured, but you had a couple others. You know, data at rest versus data at motion. Yep. Very different way of thinking about data. And then inside data, versus outside data, yep. uh, and really moving from a pure reliance on the inside data to the outside data. Talk about you know, these just tectonic shifts in really the data sources uh, and availability and the ways you manage them, and then applying that into the analytics. It was interesting to see that, because uh, I, I saw that slide yesterday um, in some of the practice sessions, and it was interesting that, you know, I was thinking about it, I'm like, wow, this really isn't just about compliance, which was what that, that particular session was about, but you can really apply that to everything. That is what's happening, right? The fact is that you know, we, we used to think about data very differently, right? Not only do we think mostly about structured information in, that was kind of contained in these systems that we were managing and everything else we sort of ignored, but we really just looked at what was in our four walls. And you know, I think if you look back even you know, 15, 20 years ago, the only companies that were really, or, you know, there were some, uh, some exceptions to this, but the, the main companies that were taking external data were financial services companies because there was an incentive around it. They had the ability to kind of take in these feeds that were coming in from, you know, uh, at the time, you know, the Telekers and the Reuters and all those kind of guys sending in those data. And they, and they were using that data to make um, decisions. And uh, you know, I think what's happened now is that the, the aperture for that has opened up so that almost every company is looking at that external data. So the fact that, that you need to now deal with you know, structured and unstructured data and data that really can come from anywhere is really changing the emphasis that companies are putting on analytics. And it's allowing, you know, creating new opportunities, but allowing people to do things they never could have thought of doing before. And that's what's really exciting about the space. It's just that there's so much potential. And every day I hear a new story that's just amazing about how people are using information like that to completely change the way they do things. Everybody talks about sort of digitizing their business, the digital economy, the API economy. Mm -hmm. um, how does that meme affect your engineering priorities and how you apply resources? Well, well I mean, you know, most of our focus is really on that. It's really on that d digitization and, and uh, you know, trying to create relevance out of information that might be, you know, might be circumstantial. You don't, 
it, it may be data exhaust even. It may be things that come out of the back end of you know, some process that really is important to the business. But being able to get, make sense of that, create, find what's relevant about that and bring it to the business user is really what we focus on. And you know, whether it's in the Internet of Things space or uh, financial planning, there's really interesting uh, data that, that is, in most cases, just not being used. You know, a vast, vast majority of it's not being used at all. And the, the uh, smartest companies and the companies that are, that are outperforming their peers are figuring out how to use that data faster than their competition. Even in our space, um, you look at the companies that are doing really well in the technology sector, they're the ones that are figuring out how to use their own data and apply it in new ways. Either sell it or you know, ap apply it to improve the way they do things, the way they sell, the way they market, uh, the way they build products, all of that. It's a very interesting phenomenon to watch across all industries right now. How about, um, you mentioned big data before, you know, Hadoop, sort of this new thing. Yeah. How has this concept of, you know, data's everywhere, <laughs> right? Ship the, ship the five megabytes of code to a petabyte of data. How has that changed your world? Because people think of your world as largely centralized, you know, kind of command and control. Yeah, uh, it's, it's changed it dramatically. I mean, in fact, b uh, both the, aspect of um, you know, data coming from everywhere and just the economics of the amount of data that you have to deal with right. have made it pretty much impossible for people to stay in a completely on-prem kind of uh, um, installation mode where they, they do everything and pull everything into a central location and try to process it locally. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, people are starting to really take advantage of cloud infrastructure for that. And you know, Hadoop taught us that you can create scalable uh, cloud infrastructure that can process data very uh, economically, um, and that uh, I could take commodity hardware and do almost anything. Uh, and now new technologies like Spark um, are really starting to bring that same sort of paradigm into real-time processing of information. So those are areas that, you know, to us, th those are the tools of the future that are helping us to help companies to take advantage of this stuff. And Hadoop, we've been on that, you know, train for a while now, and um, now we're really investing heavily in Spark. We see that as a, a very big differentiator for companies to be able to uh, process that that same kind of data in real time and use the same kind of programming, uh, you know, uh, paradigms that they use for Hadoop. So, kind of the in, in, in memory analog to to. to Blue acceleration is that right? Is that the way to think about it? Or? Yeah, yeah, and in some ways they're I mean, very source. similar. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you know, it's it's all in memory. It's distributed processing, and uh, what's what's good about Spark is that um, you know, if you're familiar with Hadoop, then you probably have a pretty good chance of being able to figure out Spark pretty quickly. And there's so many, so much energy going into it right now that it supports different programming languages. Um, like I said, the model's pretty familiar and it allows you to transition from both batch-oriented processing to streaming processing and doing it at, at a speed you just can't achieve with any, anything else in the market today. What are the challenges as a, as a software engineer uh, in terms of taking a, a code base that has is, is come about from acquisitions, a lot of organic development, rather large, um, and then sort of accommodating these sort of modern technologies that we've been talking about. What are the challenges and how is IBM meeting those? Yeah, well, it makes you change fast, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the problem, right? You used to be able to say, okay, well, we're going to be on RDBMS technology and, you know, 10 years later, you're still on the same RDMS, RDBMS technology. That doesn't happen that way anymore, right? The technology is changing so fast and it's a great thing, actually, because it's allowed, it's created this innovation model that has moved technology faster in the last three years than it moved in the, the 10 years prior. Um, it, but with that comes a challenge, because as you start to build out these systems, whether it's our own internal software or our customers implementing our software and other things, uh, you have to be open to working with a broader ecosystem of technology bases. Some of those, a lot of it comes from open source. Some of it comes from you know, the vendor community. Some of it's you know, produced by our own customers. And so it's not, you know, we've, I think IBM has come to the realization um, over the last five years that it's not really all about us providing every end-to-end -end piece of the technology portfolio, right? It's really about us living in an ecosystem. And how do we create stuff that, that facilitates uh, adoption of many different kinds of new technologies uh, that's flexible enough to change very quickly and that allows customers to adopt uh, kind of innovative cutting edge stuff at a faster rate. And that to me has been um, you know, one of the big changes that we've seen 
and we've had to really adjust to it internally. We, we update our products constantly. We embrace uh, open source like you wouldn't believe. In fact, we're one of the largest contributors to open source across the board. Um, I've put a lot of things in my own portfolio into the open source community. So we're much more deeply ingrained into the developer community and, and into the open source community than we were ever were in the first you know, several years that I was here. So that's been an interesting and I think a refreshing change. Well, and IBM's always had strong uh, open source you know, ethos. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, Linux. Yep. Kind of you, you. You started it within sort of the enterprise co company Absolutely. base, but but architecture matters, right? So, how do you deal with that complexity? Is it is it a is it a layer you put in? Is it just a, 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 the software was originally designed to be flexible? I mean, going from a client server era to an internet era to a cloud era, how do you? Yeah, it's a, it's Did a, you just get lucky, or <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's definitely a challenge, right? Yeah. I mean, as you move to this sort of cloud infrastructure, it becomes you know we moving to N tier was one thing because you kind of moved away from you know just having one uh, central location to now maybe spreading this thing across commodity servers that may be located in many different locations, and you want to take advantage of the high availability and load balancing across all of that, and that, that became a, a challenge. Uh, with, with sort of the cloud infrastructure and what we see now, um, it introduces the, uh, the ideas of uh, multi-tenancy mm -hmm. and um, you know, different levels of scalability, you know, the, the level of um, auto-scaling that you can build into things now to, for the resiliency. Uh, all of that stuff is extraordinarily exciting, but it's also challenging because you have to now figure out how to retrofit that into everything you do. So it doesn't happen overnight. Look, you know, we've got a lot of technologies. We've got a long journey to go through to get all the way there. And where possible, we're leapfrogging. We, we don't want to just say, okay, I'm going to take this thing that I've had for 20 years and somehow pretend it's going to be cloud, call it cloud, and slap it into the cloud and try to make it work there. Um, you know, we may do that for some period of time while we transition. But now, then we look for the new technologies that can help us to move faster to that, that next state, to that cloud-centric state. And that, um, you know, that allows us to uh, begin to adopt technologies and pull them in to the core uh, at a faster pace and really not have to worry about you know, dragging all of our, our legacy with us. But at the same time, you know, we do have a lot of customers that are on the old world. So one of our responsibilities as being IBM is to help customers through that transition. Right? We can't just leave a bunch of people and say, okay, we're going to go off to the new thing, see you later. We have to help them tr transition with us. And that's and, that bridge. And that's, so you know, it's not it's cloud washing, things. folks, it's called the bridge. That's right, yeah, there you go, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what about, you mentioned multi-tenancy. There's, there's a debate, kind of a debate. There's a discussion <laughs> going on in the industry of multi-tenancy versus multi-instance, you know, multi-tenancy. Um, some people say it's bad, others say it's good. What's, you brought it up, what's your take on multi-tenancy? I'm a client, I'm nervous about noisy neighbors, yeah. I'm, no I'm nervous about security, of course, you have these discussions all the time with people. Convince it's, it's, me that it's I'm a safe. Simple, it's a simple cost equation, really. I mean, y you're pretty safe these days. You certainly have noisy neighbor issues anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. um, and noisy neighbor issues uh, can be overcome with really good auto scaling. But generally speaking, you're going to have them no matter what technology base you're on if you're in a multi-tenant type environment. And this happens across anybody's cloud infrastructure and anything that you're running on. So uh, noisy neighbor is probably one of those things that, yeah, okay, that one you, I'll give you. From a security perspective, you know, there's security technologies in place now that are going to make it pretty safe out there. Now, if you're dealing with stuff that, you know, uh, you can't even have it running on anybody else's equipment because you have to have a guard standing over it or something all, all the time, then yeah, you're not going to be able to run in that type of environment. But, you know, I, I think most of the market has gotten over most of the security concerns associated with multi-tenancy. Uh, so it really comes down to the noisy neighbor thing most of all. Um, but, you know, customers really don't want multi-tenancy. I mean, that's not what they want, but, but the vendors all need it because that gives you an, an economy that, um, you know, allows you to run this cloud infrastructure at a very low cost. And so customers like it because their costs are low. They don't necessarily want to share the infrastructure. So we really provide the options around that. We allow people to isolate their environments. We allow people to have multi-tenant environments where we support them. We even allow people to run in a hybrid mode because a lot of times if you do have a security concern where you really just cannot have this running in the cloud, you know, for whatever reason, um, you may want to still have that stuff running on-prem. So you want to have some, the ability to run some stuff on-prem and some stuff in the cloud. So you let the customer make that choice and that's if right. they want to pay for it, that's right. Let that's them right. pay for it. Yep, exactly. And that's part of our philosophy is to help customers in that journey. Right? It's, a, it's a journey that, that they're going to step through over years.
Michael, what kind of technologies are you looking at that excite you? Um, coming down there, you mentioned Spark. Yep. Um, that's obviously something that's exciting. Yeah. You know, the real-timeness of Spark. Other things that you're looking at that you could see? Yeah, you know, so we do, you know, space? it's interesting. There's a lot of open source stuff now. Um, we're doing a lot of work with, with Spark. We do a lot of work with Kafka. Um, Kafka is a, a project that's in the, uh, more of the messaging space. It came out of LinkedIn. Um, Spark is an area that we're doing a very heavy investment. We opened up a Spark uh, center out in uh, San Francisco area. So uh, there's a lot of open source technologies out there. I think you know when I start to think about um, technology bases that, I, that I'm really interested in, I'm really interested right now in a lot of the stuff around analytics, um, building analytics and, and the communities that have built up around that. So we've been doing a lot of work around uh, Python and R. Um, doing a lot of investment around uh, enabling the uh, R technologies to support R and Python models. Uh, we're, we've been doing a lot of stuff around IPython notebooks, things like uh, Jupyter and stuff like that, that allow people to be able to, data scientists really, to be able to work in a uh, constrained environment that they can start to you know, build out models, actually execute code in, share, um, you know, interchange these models, and then be able to have those poured over and run directly in a Spark Cluster. I mean, those types of things are, are uh, what I see as sort of the future for, da for the data science world. And then, of course, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is translate that back into a set of capabilities that a non-data scientist can actually use. So take those same models, plug them out, and plug them into something like um, Watson Analytics that allows a relatively uh, you know, non-technical person uh, you know, a, a, maybe a power user or a line of business person to be able to run the same kinds of statistical a analytics or optimization analytics in an environment that is very uh, non-intimidating. And they can just play with their data, see the impact of those models and understand it in business language. I love it. Uh, head of engineering at, at, at analytics for the company that owns SPSS talking about investing in R. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and I, we were talking earlier about how Companies like IBM are learning to transition, yes. and one of those big, you know, learnings is don't be, a f don't try to protect the past from the future. That's Embrace right. the future. Yeah, I mean, we we obviously firmly believe at SPSS, and yeah, of we, you know, SPSS offers a different set of um, value propositions to many customers, but there's a huge community out there around R and Python as well. So. Our, our philosophy has become really about embracing those technologies. You know, bring the best of our capabilities around how enterprises want to consume that technology, which we're very good at, and help them to be able to ingest those open source technologies in a way that doesn't break them, right? I can't just take, you know, uh, say I'm going to be open to every open source project out there, and then I have 47 different versions of, you know, three forks of, a, of some open source project that are running rampant all over my IT organization. It's too hard to do that. It's not governed. So we can help customers to put a management infrastructure around it, a security infrastructure around it, a scalability infrastructure around it, a reliability infrastructure around it, and that then allows them to take these technologies in and use them in innovative ways without having the risk that they would normally have and just opening the doors wide open. All right, last question. Sort of put on the, break out the binoculars. What do you see in the, in the midterm? And then telescope, long, long term. Where, where's this business going? You know, it's interesting. I, I think it's actually, it's on the same trajectory. So I think where I'm, what I'm seeing happening is bringing power to the user. And this is something actually we've been on this path for probably uh, seven, eight years now. But starting to empower the individual business decision maker within companies, that is really starting to accelerate at a pace that I've, I haven't seen in a long time. And it's more, you know, it used to be about descriptive analytics and having nice reports and stuff like that. Um, now it's really about bringing tools for exploration, as you can see with things like uh, Watson Analytics. And I think what we'll find ourselves in is, um, you know, maybe 10 years down the road, maybe shorter than that, you won't make a decision in business without a, a computer helping you to make that decision all the time. And it's kind of like, you know, you look at things like the, the glassware that has the integrated um, uh, c computers in it that are answering questions for you as you're, as you're working. I think there's going to be those types of interfaces that we're going to be dealing with all the time. And I guess it's kind of like the uh, Star Trek where you're talking to the bridge computer, right? Um, there's going to be computer-assisted decision-making all the time, cognitive, and pres uh, predictive and prescriptive types of analytics built into every decision we make. And it's kind of scary in some ways, but a lot of ways it's, we're going to make better decisions because we're going to have all the information we need 
digested and given to us in a way that, that allows us to make those decisions better. It's not going to remove the human out of the decision-making process, but it's going to facilitate uh, humans making better decisions. Exciting future. I, um, I just <laughs> thought of like 20 more questions, but we don't have time. <laughs> All right, well, listen, thanks very much for, for coming to the Cube. Really appreciate it. Uh, Michael Curry, running engineering for the analytics side of the business for IBM. Great insights. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Jeff Frick and I will be back. This is the Cube. Check out ibmvisiongo.com. It's our interactive digital platform. This is the Cube, IBM Vision. We're right back. <laughs>